is a profile from uh, every, most everybody out there will know what I mean by the inter -I. These are seniors in residential care. These are seniors under home care in the community. And if you're, in, uh, if you're on home supports, you're in home care. But if you're on home care, you aren't necessarily getting home supports, but most of you are. And these are seniors living in assisted living. Now, the limitations of these data are, the, these are full census data. This is every single, these are 27,000 profiles, and these are 33,000 uh, health assessment profiles. This is only a sample of profiles, and I can give you the complicated reason, but it's how we do it, uh, assisted living in this province. But things you would expect to see, which is in residential care, 56% uh, of the population is over 85, 40% in uh, community care, 60%, actually fairly, fairly advanced age in our assisted living settings. A diagnosis of Alzheimer's or other dementia. Here's, the, here's another myth buster. Everybody in residential care does not have Alzheimer's. So there's two ways to look at how you portray, you know, over half the people have dementia. Yes, that's true. But guess what? 39% of people living in our residential care facilities actually don't have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia. And even that, as you know, there is a spectrum in there. Um, certainly people living in the community, 34% under home care, have the same diagnosis. So what this is telling us as, we, as I go walk through this data with you is we, care, we can care for a very high level of acuity in the community and in assisted living. So a diagnosis of a psychiatric or mood disorder, it's 30% in residential care. It's still pretty high. It's 21% in the community and 20% in assisted living. Uh, we give them a little more medication for it in residential care, but that's another story for another day. Um, so then we look down, uh, needing to reside in a special care secure dementia unit. Arguably, this is the population that you simply cannot care for at home or in assisted living. Um, you, you could, with an angel of mercy co-residing caregiver, do it at home. But that may be an unrealistic uh, expectation. Um, minor assistance needed to complete personal care activities. This is as you would expect, 85% of people um, in the community are at a uh, minor level. Interestingly enough, though, a higher percentage in assisted living. So what this tells us is they're higher functioning in assisted living than they are in the community. And then, as you would expect, uh, a lower population of the high functioning people in residential care. Moderate to significant assistance needed. Um, this is, as you would expect, a much higher percentage in residential care. But even in the community, look at that. It's higher than in assisted living. Um, mild cognitive impairment, as you would expect, um, a much lower percentage. But still, 38% of people in residential care only have mild to moderate. And so we know what that means. They're scoring about 22 on the mini mental. I took the mini mental, oh, about nine, 10 months ago. I scored 27 out of 30, just to put it in perspective. You should all do it. The counting back by seven is not as easy as you think. Um, here's the one, combination of complex conditions indicating high or very high need for residential care. Um, that's only 82% of the people in residential care, so we want to think about that. Um, here's another one I'm going to skip through because I want to leave some time for questions. Requires wheelchair for indoor mobility, 50% in residential care, as you would expect to see. But here's something interesting. 11% of the people in the community under home care primarily use a wheelchair, but it's only 5% of the people in assisted living. As you can see, I've got some questions about assisted living. Um, so let's move to the next slide. So we developed, and this was part of the uh, report that came out a few weeks ago, and it's going to feature in the, a bit in the housing report. This is the one where we, we went into the data and we developed profiles of people who could live independently, who were living independently in the community. And then we transposed that over the population in our residential care facilities, and we compared it to BC and Alberta. And what you see here are three different profiles. So these folks light physical and light cognitive needs. So these are folks who actually have fairly good cognitive function and fairly good physical function. 6.1% of residents in BC residential care facilities actually fit this prof profile, which you kind of scratch your head, well, why are they there? Now, there'll be an explanation for some. But when we compare to Alberta, 
and to a much lesser degree Ontario. Okay, so where are these people in Alberta? Because they're somewhere. We're not that different from Albertans. We like to think we are, but we're actually not. Profile number two, dementia care needs. So these are people who have some, their impairment is cognitive, not physical. This is a population where you could perhaps have a form of specialized assisted living. You need a little bit more monitoring. Um, we have 5.4% of our population in residential care fitting this profile. And look at both Ontario and Alberta, much lower. These people, these people live actually very successfully in the community, particularly not even with a co-residing caregiver, but they, if they have a family member involved in their life because there are monitoring systems out there. And then this one, higher physical care needs. So these are people who have full cognitive function. Their issue is physical frailty. So they might be in a wheelchair, which makes them a two-person transfer. Uh, they might have uh, significant tremors. Uh, they, um, uh, an MS profile person. 4.7% of our population in residential care fits that uh, profile. Only 1% in Alberta and 3% in Ontario. So it does raise some questions. So we went out to Alberta to find out where are these people. And because home care is one answer, but home care has a limitation once you no longer have a co-residing caregiver. And Alberta has a different re uh, assisted living um, format. They have levels of assisted living. And I don't know how old everybody in the room is, but I'm old enough to remember when we had levels of care in British Columbia. We used to have personal care, we had IC level one, two, three, four, and then we would have extended care. Now, good intentions, well intentioned, so I'm not blaming anybody, because I remember when we created complex care and why we created complex care. So we said, we don't want people to have to move, right? That was the theory behind complex care. Let's put them in one facility and they can age in that facility. But there's been an unintended consequence to that. And the unintended consequence was we didn't quite appreciate how different the populations were going to be within that complex care catch-all, if you will, and how it's going to result in some people who probably are having a fairly uninspiring experience in residential care. And so here's, uh, in Alberta, they have levels of supported living, and then they have extended care. It does look very different. They have, they have an even higher level called SL4D. D is for dementia. We, it's why you have to go put eyes on the data, as I say, because on the, when we look at the data tables, they look very, whoa, 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 this is great. But then you go out there and you look at it and you realize that really SL4D does look like extended care or residential care in BC. It's a slightly recalibrated model, but it would be like our licensed dementia housing kind of, kind of thing. It, it's for dementia people who don't have uh, major behavioral issues. So we arguably, that's, that's not a good comparison. But SL4, which is before you get to that, is comparative to what our assisted living could be. And look at what we see here. I want to point out that the level of cognitive impairment is actually the same. So um, a CPS score of three or higher, both Alberta and BC, it's 18%. So there are, these are, this is not about cognitive impairment, but look at the ADL three or higher and look at the wheelchair use. This is about, for whatever reason, we are not accommodating frailty, physical frailty in assisted living. And assisted living is about a community of interest. It's about coming together, sitting together, having a meal, talking to people. Um, and you can do that in a wheelchair. And talk about ageism, go back to my previous, we wouldn't dream of putting Rick Hansen in residential care. But when he turns 85, we do. And we have to think about that. Okay, so what are the next steps? We need to shift the culture, we need to shift the resources, and we need to align our incentives. We have got to shift our culture to one of accepting the rights of seniors 
to decide the level of risk they want to accept. Not everybody wants to accept a lot of risk. We need to remember that. There will be people who will want the safety and security of residential care, and they are entitled to that. Those are the people who lived all their lives. They took every extended warranty that was ever out there. They took every prepackaged vacation. They da 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 da. Okay, then there's the hippie chicks. They fought administration, they fought authority, they fought conformity all their lives. They hiked through Nepal, they did. Okay, they're going to accept a significant amount of risk, and we ought to let them do that. And that's the culture shift that has to happen. Shifting the resources. So then we have to shift the resources around uh, uh, the, the people who want to accept the risk in living in the community. So they deserve some support. I mean, if we're going to spend, on average, whatever it is, I think it's about $4,500 per resident, subsidizing them in residential care, give them the $4,500 in the community, and let them go live at, at risk. We've got to shift those. Uh, resources and we've got to align incentives, align incentives for the care providers, for the service providers, around what it is the people want. We spend a lot of time determining what is the best clinical outcome for people in residential care. Arguably, the only outcome that matters is what the person wants in residential care. We don't send people to residential care to fix them. That's what they go to the hospital for. We send them to residential care to live. And we ought to do a better job of letting them live with the risk that they want. And we do over-clinicalize uh, some, uh, to some extent, our residential care. <laughs>